Hello, and welcome or welcome back to the CMCC Mechanochemistry Discussions. This seminar series is hosted by the NSF-funded Center for Mechanical Control of Chemistry, or the CMCC. This seminar series is streamed live on the third Thursday of every month at 10 a.m. Central Time. The seminars are also hosted on YouTube, so you can watch them anytime. We've had an outstanding slate of speakers in 2020 and 2021, some of whom are shown here, and we have many more exciting speakers coming up. We hope you join us for all of them. Before we get started, quick thank yous. First, thanks to Dr. James Batiste, Director of the CMCC, Jennifer Belsick, the Center's Administrative Coordinator, and three students who contribute to the seminar series, Noah, Sergio, and Quintarius. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Please do follow us on YouTube at CMCC Mechanochemistry Discussions and also on Twitter. Before we get started, a few quick notes. Uh, the seminar is uh, streamed live, but it's being recorded. If you have questions during the seminar, please uh, email them to us at cmccdiscussions at gmail.com and they'll be propagated to the speaker, or you can enter them directly into YouTube. Note, however, that we do reserve the right to remove comments if necessary. Finally, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Felipe Garcia. Dr. Garcia obtained his bachelor's and master's in chemistry from Oviedo University in Spain. After a short internship at BASF in Germany, he moved to the University of Cambridge to carry out his graduate studies as a Cambridge European Trust and Newton Trust Scholar. In 2005, he was awarded a non-stipendary junior research fellowship at Wolfson College, which allowed him to expand his research horizons. In September 2006, he was appointed a college lecturer in organic chemistry at Newham and Trinity Colleges. And in March 2011, he moved to Nanyang Technological University, where he's been working on developing complex and robust main group systems, as well as mechanochemistry for the sustainable sy synthesis of compounds and materials. Join me in welcoming Dr. Garcia for his presentation, Main Group Mechanochemistry, Challenges and Opportunities for a Sustainable Society. Okay, thank you, Ashley, for the kind introduction. And I would also like to thank James and the other uh, CMCC members for the kind invitation uh, to speak today. Uh, so I have spent a, a lot of my career doing a traditional inorganic synthesis of main group compounds uh, and complexes. And over the past year, I have begun to explore uh, how to make chemistry more sustainable and try to find different approaches and methodologies for the chemical synthesis. On that note, I would like to just share with you my work on mechanochemistry. So what are the benefits? Uh, what are sometimes the, the downsides? We can discuss that later if you want. And some of the challenges involved. Yeah. So um, in the fall of 2015, uh, the United Nations adopted a sustainable uh, development goals, uh, 17 sustainable development goals to change uh, the world for the better. So uh, these goals have been formulated to take a decisive uh, and coordinated action to benefit the global humanity. So among these green sustainable goals, the ACS uh, has identified seven of them, which are here uh, in the screen, uh, where chemical enterprise has a unique role to play uh, in reaching uh, these goals. In addition, if we think about the 12 principles of green chemistry, this provides a powerful approach uh, and, a, and a route uh, to help chemists realize uh, these sustainable goals. Um, therefore, advances in uh, chemistry and green chemistry at both fundamental and applied levels uh, have been and will continue to be instrumental in reaching uh, these sustainable goals. So uh, my research for uh, anyone who's not aware of, of what I do, uh, is focused in uh, main group chemistry and is based on four different fundamental pillars that we apply to, to the research that we do. So it's synthesis and molecular design, then look for non-conventional synthetic routes, uh, um, develop complexity for enhanced functionality and trying to uh, find uh, or develop technological and bio biological applications for main group compounds and complexes. Uh, so these areas uh, or these pillars gives uh, rise to three main areas of research in my group, which is the uh, main group mechanochemistry, which will be the one discussed today, 
the more traditional approaches to uh, groups and co main group complexes and frameworks and materials, and then uh, main group uh, mitochondrial delivery vectors. Uh, so today I'm going to focus on, on main group mechanochemistry. So if we classify the 12 principles of chemistry that are shown here in relation or the formation to, to mechanochemistry, this can be classified into three different categories, like related, somewhat related, and not obvious relations. And this uh, uh, basically is the way that we can see how mechanochemistry relates with the 12 principles of uh, green chemistry and how the 12 principles of green chemistry can be realized by using mechanochemistry. This is an approach that is starting to be a, a quite a focus in the community, as it can be seen by these two papers almost uh, at the same uh, time uh, that has been published this year, discussing mechanochemistry in terms of upscaling, uh, make, uh, the 12 principles of mechanochemistry and how they apply. Yeah? In addition, mechanochemistry has been recently named by UPAC as one of the 10 innovations that will change the world. So therefore, we will uh, like to, or I would like to show you what uh, mechanochemistry brings uh, to the main group uh, uh, area. Yeah? So um, for who is not a, an expert in mechanochemistry, or if you're not very familiar, I guess most of, of, of the audience is, Mechanochemistry is an emerging field of chemistry, which combines uh, chemical engineering, materials chemistry, and environmental sciences. And if, during the mechanochemical process, uh, mechanochemical transformations are induced by mechanical forces. So mechanical forces are the origin of the chemical transformations. Uh, if, if you are not familiar with the tools, I will quickly go and, and explain what the tools are. You can uh, use uh, batch processing for mechanochemistry, which generally is ball milling and planetary mills. These are the jars, and this is the milling action. Yeah. Or uh, there is uh, also continuous processing, which is based on two uh, twin screw splitters. Okay. It's where the chemicals go here in the feeder, they go through uh, the, the, the extrusion pathways where the mechanical, mechanical forces are applied, and then they, at this end, uh, you obtain the targeted compounds. So if we think about mechanochemistry versus uh, solution-based methods, uh, on my experience, and you can see what I'm used to doing in my, in my lab, yeah, for, for most of my career, we work with uh, relatively or quite air-sensitive compounds. Most of them uh, need to be um, <clears throat> synthesized under quite strict anaerobic conditions. So the solvent choice is important. The solvent treatment may be required if it's uh, air sensitive or moisture sensitive. Solubility of the reagents, like in any area of chemistry, is crucial, and the concentration can affect the reaction. Whereas in mechanochemistry, what we have observed is that uh, um, there is no heating required. It can be done at ambient temperature most of the times. Yeah? Uh, they are quite rapid. The reactions can go for uh, for minutes uh, to hours, but usually it's much shorter uh, reaction uh, time than uh, in solution. They're solvent free. They're independent of the solubility of the reagents. Mechanochemistry is also controllable and reproducible uh, in contrast to what many chemists that are not uh, familiar with mechanochemistry think, uh, which is that it's a very harsh method. There is relatively scalable, um, and uh, it also provides a new chemical space where solubility uh, and a new reactivity um, could be obtained and solubility is not a problem. So mechanochemistry has been applied to a wide range of, of um, areas such as uh, MOVs, nanoparticles, polymers, APIs, inorganic reactions, organic synthesis, but it wasn't so much uh, applied to main group synthesis when we started. And so. When we started doing mechanochemistry, there were very few um, examples of main group synthesis performed mechanochemically. So some of these examples that were uh, per, um, um, reported at the time involve uh, strontium complexes, germanium, trisaral complexes, imine complexes. And today I'm gonna talk about a uh, main group mechanochemistry within the context of phosphorus nitrogen systems. So, and why is this? Because um, phosphorus nitrogen systems is uh, one of the bread and butter of our group. And they are quite unique systems and they're not very well known. So this will also uh, help uh, giving them spotlight for, for a little bit today. Yeah? So what can mechanochemistry offer to main group synthesis? Yeah? And as I mentioned, we're gonna use the phosphorus nitrogen frameworks as a case study. 
Before we start talking about uh, mechanochemistry, I would like to give you a very short introduction on cyclophosphosane compounds, because it's gonna be the main driving uh, force and link between all the reactions that we're gonna be discussing in detail. So cyclophosphosanes are compounds that are saturated in organic rings, comprising alternative phosphorus and nitrogen atoms. This is a phosphosane. Please do not confuse it with a phosphosine where there are double bonds between phosphorus and nitrogen. Phosphorus nitrogen bonds are quite labile due to the bond polarity and the variable hybridization and oxidation states possible for phosphorus. So frameworks based on phosphorus nitrogen bonds, they still represent a major synthetic challenge in mangrove chemistry. So these species uh, can be um, um, or have been reported in a wide range of different topologies. So you can form dimers, trimers, bicyclic compounds, and then, uh, for example, in this case, ornamental structures or this uh, macro, double vector macrocycle. Uh, and the, the good or the, the advantage or the, the, the appeal of these species is that they have a great structural and chemical versatility that makes them ideal candidates for numerous applications, such as transition metal chemistry, uh, anti-cancer drugs, asymmetric catalysis, post-gas chemistry, et cetera. Yeah? So um, something that I would like to highlight at this point, uh, compounds four and uh, five, sorry, five and six are uh, isomers one another. Yeah? And then we will discuss how this can be interconverted uh, one another uh, using mechanochemistry. So I'm going to share with you um, three to four different short stories uh, on the advantage shown by mechanochemistry in the synthesis of phosphosane compounds. So the first uh, little uh, snapshot on um, me of mechanochemistry in terms of phosphosane frameworks uh, is enhanced synthesis of, of these species. So if you think about these species and how they are synthesized in solution, so the starting material generally is this dichlorodicyclo uh, 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 cyclodiphosphosine, this uh, could be reacted uh, with uh, organic acids, for example, alcohols or amines in the presence of, of, of a base to form the di-substituted, symmetrically substituted uh, dichlorocyclophosphosine derivatives. So when we started, we thought, okay, can, can these uh, species that seem to be relatively fragile uh, under certain conditions, can this species be obtained using uh, mechanochemistry? Will this species um, survive what we thought at that stage could have been uh, quite a set of harsh conditions? So uh, what we started uh, doing, uh, Xiaoyang started working on this uh, a few years back. Uh, so we um, reacted the dichlorocyclic dichlorocyclic starting materials with a series of uh, organic acids. Uh, and these organic acids were selected because they have low solubility, not protic solvents. So this species, uh, the starting material is only um, chemically compatible with non protic solvents. And to dissolve these um, reagents uh, in non protic solvents, it will require an, a disproportionate amount of solvent. Yeah? So what we did is we um, in a ball mill, uh, we started materials together in stainless steel yard uh, for um, a time that ranges between uh, 60 minutes and, and two, three hours, and we obtain the target of the species in quantitative yields. And these are the um, structures, the crystal structures uh, of these compounds. You're gonna see quite a few of crystal structures today because uh, the core of our uh, chemistry is structural chemistry. Yeah? So, so we need to crystallize the materials to prove that they have, they have made them. Yeah? So in this case, we have uh, shown that mechanochemistry enables the use of poorly soluble uh, materials, uh, which has been, uh, also the focus of a lot of organic chemistry recently. Yeah. So we also uh, decided to, to um, just um, change gears and try to see if we could uh, synthesize uh, macrocycles. So if you think about uh, the way macrocycles uh, can be obtained, uh, hybrid organic and organic uh, cyclodiphosphosine macrocycles can be obtained reacting a one-to-one -one ratio of dichlorocyclophosphosine with uh, difunctionalized uh, organic linkers, which will then uh, form uh, the macrocycle. We know that macrocycles, uh, generally, uh, it requires the dilution methods uh, to, for, for, to obtain them in high yields. So we thought that uh, can this be done uh, mechanochemically, where, uh, in theory, the concentration would be relatively high compared to um, a, 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 a largely diluted um, um, Schlenk or, or Rambotan plasma. 
So um, we started with the uh, vector cyclophosphatidine as our standard um, uh, starting material. And then we reacted with both uh, symmetric and asymmetric organic linkers to form a set of uh, organic, uh, hybrid organic inorganic cyclophosphatidine uh, macrocycles. And uh, we obtained them in almost quantitative yields in times that ranges between two hours or six hours. And uh, these are the crystal structures here. This uh, compound is of particular interest because uh, it resembles a calixidin type of uh, species. So we are trying now to do some post uh, chemistry with it. However, uh, these species are uh, quite fragile, so it's still uh, ongoing uh, work. Yeah. So in this case, uh, we have shown that mechanochemistry uh, can uh, selectively obtain macrocyclic species without the need of uh, deletion methods for in the case of uh, cyclophosphatidine compounds. So something else that I would like to, to discuss as well um, is that uh, the enhanced selectivity. Uh, so we have shown that we can synthesize these species. Can we actually get something that is a bit more than just synthesizing vein high yields without no solvents? So for that purpose, we try to synthesize uh, air uh, stable cyclophosphatidines. So in this case, um, the solution uh, root to um, air stable uh, cyclophosphatidine species is a multi-step solution based method where the dichloro dicyclophosphatidine is reacted with uh, um, an organic acid to form the disubstituted um, compound, as we have seen. And then this needs to be oxidized uh, overnight. Yeah? So these reactions require two consecutive overnight reflux, and between uh, the first step and the second step, it requires purification. Okay, so if, if we think about the solution based route, it requires reflux overnight, isolation, and purification, followed by reflux overnight for the oxidation step, isolation, and purification to get this species. More importantly, and, and uh, is that these uh, compounds um, can be obtained in season transmixtures depending on the experimental conditions. Yeah? So you need to fine tune the experimental conditions uh, uh, in terms of solution based methods uh, quite a lot in order to favor the cis uh, species, the cis isomer, which is the one that is most used uh, for uh, transition metal uh, complexation. So what we decided to do is we, we try an orthogonal one-step mechanical method where we, um, uh, we use um, the starting material and we loaded the jar with all the chemicals required. So we have the organic acid, the calcogen element for the oxidation and the base, and uh, we uh, boil mill between six and 10 hours, uh, and we obtain uh, only the six product. Uh, these are the crystal structures, and uh, this is basically just to prove that these species are as stable as, as we wanted. Um, one of the problems of these studies is that it delays uh, the publication for at least one year sometimes. Yeah, so um, we don't do this very often. So if you think about the mechanochemical uh, reaction is uh, mixing all the reactants, we mill for six to, 12, uh, to 10 hours. We only do isolation and purification with a minimal amount of solvent for, crystalline, for crystallization purposes. Uh, whereas the solution, uh, as uh, I mentioned earlier, is just reflux overnight, isolation, purification, and then the same, the same process again. So mechanochemistry uh, enables orthogonality in the first same chemistry. There are not that many uh, orthogonal synthesis reported in mangrove chemistry, so this is quite a unique, um, uh, unique um, uh, report. And also you can see the clear advantage in terms of time uh, and solvents use. Something else that uh, we uh, wanted to, to also investigate is uh, if phosphorescence uh, or unattainable uh, phosphorescence or phosphorescence that are or have been reported not to be possible to be synthesized, if this species could be obtained mechanochemically, it has been shown that mechanochemistry can also enable chemistry that is not a common or easily uh, obtained in solution. So if you think about these two species that I highlighted at the beginning, yeah, this, this um, double-decker macrocycle is an uh, isomer to this uh, adamantal. These two are isomers one another. So we thought, can this be obtained? Can we do this isomerization uh, mechanochemically? So if we think about uh, these species, um, so uh, these um, two species can, uh, or this adamantal structure is more thermodynamically stable than the double, the macrocycle double. Yeah? So just, just to be clear on this. Yeah? So 
And in theory, and this should be able to isomerize yeah, in terms of thermodynamics. So in terms of uh, thermodynamic uh, drive, this would be the product. And this has been done, this isomerization has been done by heating uh, for 12 days uh, this solid at 156 degrees. However, the more aesthetically hindered perbutyl analog does not isomerize even at harsh conditions for 24 days. So this uh, isomerization that is, uh, can be performed for the isopropyl, it cannot be performed for the perbutyl. Then, um, okay, so why do we want to do a, perform an isomerization where potentially we can synthesize these compounds directly? So these com adamantal structures can be synthesized directly um, reacting uh, PCL3 with the uh, stoichiometric amount uh, of primary amines, put it under the flux, uh, and it can give you the adamantal structure. However, these reactions uh, um, are uh, very, very low yielding, and they do not work for a uh, perbutyl. So the evidence collected over the last two to three decades, it indicates and points that the perbutyl uh, uh, adamantal framework is unattainable due to high aesthetic and nature uh, uh, due to the presence of uh, the computer groups. So then we started to think, okay, can we perform this uh, isomerization? And so we started doing mid milling um, in the isopropyl example, uh, no reaction. Then we did a liquid assisted grinded, we got 20% yield, so we were on the right track. And finally, after quite a lot of uh, optimization, we found that the presence of lithium chloride in 20% weight weight as a, as a salt additive provides a quantitative yield uh, within only 90 minutes. So in 90 minutes, we can go from the double uh, decker macrocycle into the demantal structure for the isopropyl phase. So uh, then we thought, okay, can, can we do this uh, isomerization for the perbutyl group? We know that heating does not isomerize the double vector macrocycle even after 24 days uh, of heating. Uh, in contrast, mechanochemistry, again, the same conditions as before 90 minutes, it provides uh, the, produces the adamantal structure uh, in quantitative yields. And this is the crude of the uh, starting material and the, the, the reaction. So you can see that the reaction is transformation is very clean. And we can easily now convert this uh, double vector macrocycle into the more thermodynamically stable elemental structure uh, after 90 minutes of building. So this has caught the attention of the community and it has been highlighted uh, in quite a few places. Uh, that is something that we were quite, quite happy about. Yeah? So something that we have been interested uh, in recently is the ability to rationally design and const uh, construct crystalline solids. Yeah? For this purpose, uh, we have uh, known that mechanochemistry has enabled a lot of uh, uh, multi-component high order co-crystals in organic uh, synthesis, but not so many in terms of using relatively complex uh, inorganic building blocks. So since we are quite fond of these uh, fossil nitrogen species, we decided to just uh, try to uh, have a look at this in terms of um, the building block to uh, synthesize high order multi-component crystals. So for this purpose, what we did is that we started uh, having a look at this. So uh, this uh, like, um, terbutal, uh, uh, terbutal amine substituted uh, phosphorescein uh, in phosphorus 5 uh, state uh, can be obtained into these two different conformations due to the rotation, free rotation of the single one here. And then um, this could happen uh, um, in, in the solid crystalline solution, depending on the, on the conditions. Yeah? Uh, so in this case, then we mix it with these different components. And uh, there are different types of interactions that it can be uh, obtained yeah? uh, between these two components, the hydrogen bonding, selenium pi interactions, ion dipole, uh, and halogen bonding. So what we uh, hoped is to be able to start with individual components, then get binary crystals, maybe tertiary crystals, and maybe also the quaternary crystals if we were lucky. So this was uh, what we um, aimed to do at the beginning. And after a lot of work uh, uh, and a lot of effort, we managed to uh, show that, uh, that, uh, that in these phosphorescent species uh, are a very versatile building blocks for the synthesis of uh, co-crystals. Uh, 
binary crystals in this case here. You can see how there is a bifurcated hydrogen bonding. Then, uh, due to the presence of the selenium, this uh, species can also form part of uh, ternary crystals, um, um, neutral ternary crystals, or ionic uh, ternary crystals and quaternary crystals. So, ball milling enables uh, versatile synthetic groups to complex crystalline materials. Moreover, uh, what we have shown is that we can synthesize these uh, binary, ternary, and quaternary crystals directly, one pot from their components, which is uh, quite common. Uh, but we have also shown that mechanochemistry enables the synthesis of high order uh, co crystals, uh, starting from a uh, lower tier uh, or lower order co crystals as starting materials, as building blocks. So in this case, combining these uh, binary crystals, then you can obtain ternary crystals, or uh, combining these two ternary crystals, you can obtain these other species. Yeah? So we are we're quite happy about this, and we are trying to now build a more complex uh, main group uh, building blocks to see how a uh, supramolecular chemistry of these species uh, work uh, both in solution and mechanical. So these are the crystal structures so, uh, of the compounds that I just uh, uh, discussed. Yeah. So we have not only been synthesizing phosphorus nitrogen uh, systems, uh, we have also been synthesizing ligand and metal complexes. Um, and these species, uh, we know they're important because they play a, a, a crucial role in catalytic transformations, which provides means for more sustainable chemical processes. So we have investigated the use of mechanochemistry for the synthesis of uh, relevant ligand uh, and uh, metal complexes. Yeah? So in this case, generally, um, um, these uh, RLBs, amino acetonaphene ligands, these uh, BIN uh, ligands yeah, that are shown, shown here, uh, are synthesized by condensation of uh, quinone uh, with the corresponding aniline and the acidic conditions. And in many cases, it requires metal templation, um, which then it needs to be then uh, decomplexed to provide the um, free ligand. Yeah. So in our case, we have shown uh, that mechanochemistry can be used for the synthesis of uh, these um, ligands, which are uh, quite um, common in catalytic uh, and photocatalytic species, especially for transition metal complexes, uh, without the need of any completion. So we can uh, quite cleanly and quite fast uh, obtain uh, the ligands. And then we can also uh, have shown that we can not only obtain the ligand and the, and the metal complex uh, in, in a multi-step reaction, we can also uh, introduce and do another orthogonal uh, synthesis by having all the components into the, the jar and then mill uh, them all together and then obtain the complex in comparable yields uh, to the multi-step or the solution solution groups. Uh, so we have also enabled the synthesis of a uh, novel uh, BAN ligands and tripodal uh, mesogenic carbons here in collaboration with uh, um, Hansen So and Ellis Mankoman, as, as well as Jason Engel uh, here in, in, in MTU. And some of these species are not uh, accessible uh, through solution. Yeah? So, so it's not just uh, the main group uh, chemistry is limited to phosphorus nitrogen systems in our case. We have been doing a lot of things uh, in our lab and in collaboration with others. Also, we have been showing or expanding uh, mechanochemistry in collaboration with uh, uh, Michael Estucado in, in Singapore and, and uh, Yoshi Kai. Uh, so we have been focusing on uh, polyaromatic systems, which has a tremendous interest in the field of uh, material science and, and optoelectronics. Yeah. So we have shown that a, a coranulin-based uh, pair of nanographins, even uh, coranulin uh, can be easily and readily synthesized uh, mechanochemically. This work has been done in collaboration with Michael Estupado here in, in Singapore. And we have also shown that uh, mechanochemistry enables the cyclodehydrogenation to obtain these large nitrogen containing polyaromatics. So it's another uh, little take home message. Mechanochemistry enables uh, access of flat of curved aromatics. And the advantage is that in this case, uh, solubility is not uh, a problem. So uh, as long as the reactivity uh, is there, then mechanochemistry will be able to unlock and enable these reactions. So we have also been interested in the development uh, uh, of uh, not only upscaling uh, methodologies, but also custom-made uh, setups uh, capable of performing non-conventional mechanical reactions. 
So as I previously mentioned, mechanochemistry offers a straightforward approach to the 12 uh, principles of mechanochemistry. However, uh, several challenges need to be addressed before mechanochemical methods and mechanochemistry can be widely adopted into industrial uh, protocols or even uh, at small scale or even larger scale. A, in this respect, it is quite clear that there needs to be a synergy between uh, the 12 principles of green chemistry and the 12 principles of um, uh, green engineering. So in this case, we have also highlighted uh, and related uh, the principles of uh, green chemistry and how they, uh, or we believe they uh, relate to mechanochemistry. Yeah? So the most uh, important things that um, green engineering will gain from mechanochemistry will maximize efficiency, uh, non harder sources because uh, solvents can be eliminated and limited uh, waste production yeah, because solvents are, are uh, not or will not play an important role. So, but uh, so what, what do we mean exactly by upscaling? Because upscaling means different things to different people. Yeah? So, so depending on the scales at which we will be uh, working or the target of the scale, there are different mechanochemical uh, technologies uh, or, or instruments that can be used. Yeah? For example, we all know that vibratory mills and planetary mills, but there are also similar uh, or eccentric mills that can just get um, up to the scales of over 10 kilograms, uh, or there is continuous uh, processing, which is a, a twin extruder. Yeah? So if we look at the different types of um, the chemicals uh, within within the chemical space in terms of upscaling. Uh, so we can try to upscale in, in, in different areas using mechanochemistry, but uh, we believe that that mechanochemistry will will be most useful in custom chemicals, pharmaceuticals, and fine chemicals. It will be very difficult to compete with the petrochemical industry where the processes are very highly optimized and nothing or almost nothing is wasted. Uh, in terms of with, with mechanochemistry. But in this uh, quadrant here, which is a um, uh, low production and high chemical complexity, mechanochemistry will play a crucial role in the future. So we have reported uh, or attempted to, to do uh, quite a few um, solvent-free mechanochemical synthesis. And we have reported uh, the perovskites, the synthesis of a uh, lar large scale synthesis of perovskites using mechanochemistry. Uh, in this case, we can go from milligram scales to, to kilogram scale. Uh, you can see this is 250 grams of, of peroscope material in, in basically high, highly pure. And these powders can be pressed into a, a working uh, of, um, a photo detectors. Yeah? So, so we, can, we have shown that uh, you don't need complex uh, synthetic procedures to just synthesize peroscites or use them into uh, electronic uh, devices. So we have also uh, tried to upscale. And if we think about the way uh, catalysts are, are synthesized in laboratories that are milligrams or, or grams, we have upscale uh, this, uh, saline, this cellophane uh, aluminum complex to almost kilogram scale. So this in this bottle is around 250 grams of it. And what we have seen, and is, this is a very rough uh, calculation. Yeah? So, so um, that mechano mechanochemistry uh, roughly um, is always uh, much better at very low scales. As uh, once you start uh, uh, in, uh, increasing the scale, they start to be a bit si more more similar, or the values are are relatively. Uh, they are starting to close close the gap. But still, mechanochemistry in terms of the E factors is is better. In this case, uh, depending on where is the, where uh, if the reaction is performed in the presence of an amine because we're producing HCl. So that's a bit dangerous. Then the the e factors change. Yeah? But if if um, if the reaction is done in chemically compatible uh, unbented jars, uh, you can see that there is a huge difference uh, uh, upscaling. Yeah? So we have also calculated uh, energy con uh, consumptions and the energy saved uh, at higher scales in terms of the chemistry is is twenty five percent. And we have also calculated uh, an approximate cost uh, per kilogram. And, and you can see here uh, that uh, basically mechanochemistry is uh, a bit cheaper, which uh, if you go to even higher scales, uh, might actually mean uh, a lot of uh, higher cost reduction for the synthesis of this species. We're having also uh, pushing boundaries in terms of mechanochemistry. So uh, we all uh, have done our little engineering projects. So uh, here in Singapore, we have been developing uh, 
mechanical photoreactors. In this case, is water cooled photoreactor. We have been doing some kind of temperature control bone milling uh, uh, using heating pads, customized heating pads, and we have been using um, customizing our own milling media with uh, mixed success sometimes. That these ones, uh, for example, these FET jars here are, are able to do photochemical reactions uh, despite of not being completely uh, transparent. Right? So uh, to finalize, I would like to share the way, the way I see the field uh, uh, should or is or might develop in terms of uh, bridging the gap between the current mechanochemical basic and fundamental studies that, that I am performing and, and many of us are doing uh, towards the green manufacturing. So we all know that fundamental studies are, are, are crucial. Yeah? So we, we all uh, can discuss about the kinetics, thermodynamics, mechanisms. Then this will actually give us solvent-free synthetic protocols that can be used by other people that are not new to mechanical chemistry. We all know that in-situ measurements are crucial and will be uh, instrumental in the, in the field, but still these apparatus are not commercially available. Yeah? So it's the very limited access uh, to them. And uh, we need to, or engineering needs to be developed because as I shown you, we, we are doing, or all of us are trying to modify our mills, but still um, the um, mills or the customizations ac accessible are only uh, done um, custom made and in-house most of the time. Also future requirements. I don't think there is a very little discussion on the types of requirements for the future implementation of, of mechanical chemistry. We, I'm thinking about uh, artificial intelligence, automatization, and we're talking about upscaling all the time, but uh, we also, I also think that miniaturization of mechanochemistry will play a, a crucial role in the future because there are some compounds that they can only be used um, in milligrams at the time. So, so we, we don't need to look to go bigger. We need to also need to look to go even smaller that we can go. And also, you know, what, what, is, what is next to come? So there are other things that we should start all thinking and discussing. And this will provide what is the target uh, of mechanochemistry, which is a transformative way of performing chemical reactions, uh, which uh, can be upscaled using the industry to be able to fulfill the promise of mechanochemistry and the, um, the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. And uh, this can only be done through collaborations, uh, academic collaborations, partnerships. We are not very involved in, as a community in policies. And I think education is something that, that needs to be um, uh, really, we need to work hard in, in educating people about mechanochemistry because uh, many people don't, don't even know what we do or what is the basics. Yeah? So this is the way I see uh, the field of mechanochemistry in the future. And I hope uh, you know, we can discuss and I hope you all share uh, my vision as well of mechanochemistry as a transformative way of performing uh, chemical synthesis. I would like to acknowledge uh, my group. Um, we are quite a small group, but we, you know, we, we work hard and, and, and we, we hope that what we produce is, is of interest. Our collaborators, the funding, and um, most uh, uh, of all, uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much, Felipe. We have quite a few questions. I'm gonna cherry pick a few for you. Uh, we'll start with something simple. Can you please define, quote, main group chemistry for the non-chemists in the audience and share the overarching reasons why you're focusing on main group elements? Oh, wow, that's, that's a very philosophical question. Okay, so main group element, uh, main group chemistry is uh, chemistry involving the elements of the P block. So it's group 13, 16, 14, 14, 15, 16, 17, with the exception of carbon, which is considered um, organic chemistry. So for example, why do I focus on main group chemistry? That, that's a good idea. I, I think I, I find it always very unpredictable when I started doing my PhD. It was always the, you know, the, the, the ugly uh, uh, duckling in a way. Uh, so now, years later, main group chemistry has flourished as a very, very powerful in catalysis materials. So it, it's something that I started because it was a bit odd, a little bit quirky. Uh, and now it's, it's, it's my interest. I, I have passion. Of course, I, I mean, all kinds of research and chemistry is, is, is welcome. But I, I don't know, I like it. <laughs> because sometimes it's unpredictable and it brings a bit of spice in, into, into the chemistry. Thank you. All right, here's another one. <clears throat> For the synthesis of phosphazine, what role do you believe the lithium chloride plays to enable the synthesis? 
Well, that's the million dollar question. So, <laughs> so we, we, don't, we don't know really. Uh, we have not done uh, in situ measurements to see what's happening because I don't think we will, or at the time we did the, the studies, uh, we, we did not have access and we didn't think it was um, uh, necessary, yeah? Um, so the thing is, um, I think uh, it's a change in the, I, I think it's uh, something to do with the way the molecules interact and the way the, the energy is transmitted. We did calculation, uh, so theoretical calculations, and the only the only uh, disadvantage of going from one of the the compounds is that the the activation energy was quite large, it was uh, around 50, 50 kilo kilocals per, per mole. So I think the problem is that, uh, or what we think is that, solution does not effective uh, thermal thermal synthesis does not provide that required energy effectively to some extent because of the solvents, uh, I think that it is not effective enough or is not instant enough. You know, it, it, it kind of, maybe what you require is this kind of high energy input at the very short periods. However, something that I would like to say is that this species uh, decompose, um, all of the phosphorescence decompose if you are around 250, 300 degrees, yeah, depending on the type. So, um, it's not, we don't think it's just plasma for a long time, or we don't think it's very, very high temperatures. But, but to be honest, absolutely honest, we don't know the role that all salts, all a group a one or two salts work to some extent. So I think it's uh, the way the mechanical force are transmitted in the presence of these salts. At Thank some you. point, we will get back to it once, once the, the in-situ measurements are a bit more developed and more useful for us. Good. Thank you. All right. Here's another question. <clears throat> you showed that mechanochemical processes increase yield or efficiency of the reactions, but different reactions are accelerated by different amounts. In other words, what is the expected yield or efficiency of a different rep of these reactions in comparison to their classical solvent-driven counterparts? Okay, so so we have most of the okay, so let's 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 clarify one thing, yeah. So what I would like to, to highlight at this stage is that I'm a synthetic chemist. So to me, the important thing is the target. Uh, so we do things in solution. We have seen, reported species in solution and mechanochemically. Yeah? So, so to us, uh, what mechanochemically in generally has provided is a faster and a cleaner way to do things. So if you think about a main group green chemistry, which is something that is almost not developed so far, uh, it provides you exactly what you need, is you can get the compounds that you want. Uh, time, we are not so uh, worried about how long it takes, okay? Because we are, we've never have done optimization in terms of time. So it could be that the solutions that we, the refluxes that we do overnight, it might be taking six hours or seven hours, but sometimes it's convenience. Yeah? So uh, we have never benchmarked one against the other. So we have observed that it's generally faster, especially for oxidation reactions of the phosphorus species. Some of these oxidations could take a, a few days, uh, sometimes depending on, on, on the, the compound. And mechanochemically, within six seven hours, everything that is gonna work works. Sometimes in solution it works and mechanochemistry you just get the composition. Yeah? And this is something that of course, usually you don't publish these things unless it's relevant. Uh, but a, I think to us, just to summarize, it gives us a faster way and a more convenient way because of the non-requirement of purifying the solvents and dealing with the solvents. Uh, however, we combine solution and mechanochemistry most of the time. All right, thank you. Let's do just one more. And this is, a, I guess, a high-level question. Uh, this talk left me very excited about mechanochemistry. But coming back to the UN General Assembly goals, what chemical compounds or mechanochemical processes do you think have the most potential to impact those goals? Uh, oof, that's 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 uh, that's something that you know. Uh, I'm part of the Cost uh, uh, European Network on Mechanochemistry for the Sustainable Industry, and that's something that we have been discussing, uh, <laughs> I think, for a few years. So I think, um, to to be honest, I think there are some things that are handicapping uh, the benchmarking mechanochemistry for the sustainable goals. And one of the, one of the major um, problems is that 
I have shown, and there are plenty of, of examples of very small scales for mechanochemistry. Yeah? So, so milligrams, two grams uh, is, is, is the norm. Going above that, there are the, the number of examples uh, decreases substantially. So there is a large scale for materials. It has been uh, done uh, recently, energy materials uh, uh, by um, Balash. Uh, uh, yeah. So in that case, I think mechanochemistry, for example, I think will play a crucial role for new energy materials. Perovskites, photovoltaics, that they need a lot of solvents, very complex solvent uh, treatments. We have shown that this can be done uh, with no solvents um, in our lab, yeah, in, in, with our collaborators. So I think the, the future batteries and things like that will be crucial, not because there are more important materials than others, it's because of the implications that we have in the future of other kinds of transportation and other uh, reaching the other sustainable goals. Yeah? And I think uh, also uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, uh, active uh, pharmaceutical ingredients, drugs, uh, catalysts will be something that will play a crucial role. Once all this is established, then the technologies and the knowledge will enable doing more commodity chemicals and things that are a bit, uh, in terms of higher higher the bulk, uh, higher, higher number, like tons per year. Yeah? Something I would like to highlight is that, for example, twin extrusion at the moment is being used to synthesize MOFs, a solvent-free kilograms per hour. Yeah? So, so for certain types of materials, the implementation is, is there, but it's not very well known yet. So not many people are thinking about these technologies or these approaches as the first to try. It's always the one solution doesn't work, they will try this which is by default is training, that potentially we need to change the mindset. And this is something that uh, I mentioned about the policies and the education. We need to consider mechanochemistry as also part of the toolkit, uh, the toolbox for synthesis, not just the last resort. All right. Thank you very much, Felipe. Um, excellent presentation. And um, we're, it's you. our pleasure to have you here. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Garcia, for that outstanding presentation. And thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to sharing uh, past, present, and future CMCC mechanochemistry discussions with you on YouTube. Thank you.